Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. I am Dr. Brad Reedy, and today is Tuesday, October 12th, 2021. Tonight's format is an open forum, so any questions or topics you want to submit, we're happy to answer those. Those will be then moderated and passed on to me and to the public. Uh, Malia then will make sure that they're anonymous, so you don't have to worry about that. We do have pre-submitted questions, and I think we have eight. And the first one is a long one, so let's get right into it. Here goes. Our old, our 18-year-old son spent 16 months in residential treatment. Six months ago, he signed himself out of a sober living program, which is far away, after meeting with a girl online the week prior. He knew if he chose to leave, we'd always support him emotionally, but that we would need to financially but that he would need to financially support himself. Since that time, we've only had intermittent contact with him. We know that he graduated in June, has a place to live, that girlfriend, and a full-time job. Recently, he told us he often has anxiety about talking to us, that he doesn't know why, and he'll call when he's comfortable. We have continually told him we love him and that we don't judge him or his choices and only want to have a relationship with him. He is an only child. Prior to treatment, our home life became increasingly hostile as his drug use escalated. My husband and I have done our work since that time, but we've done minimal, minimal family therapy. Our son hasn't been back to our home, and we've only had seven in-person visits. We know he's seen some change in us, but probably not the full extent. Before he left treatment, our son had made incredible progress and worked extremely hard. We got his new, mature, insightful, we got this new, mature, mature insightful young man. At that time, he repeatedly told us how grateful he was to us for keeping him in treatment. We know our son has grown a lot, but it is still a lot of pain. We don't think he'd agree to more therapy. I guess my real question is, how do we cultivate a relationship with him when he's so far away and isn't open to seeing us? Any insight and advice you have is greatly appreciated. You know, a couple of times I've been asked to give talks on a specific topic uh, of how to get your children to talk to you. Now, typically, of course, the, the, the context of the question is, you know, when you have a child that's living with you, that, that is talking to you to some extent, but, but really not opening up to you. And, and what I talk about is the dynamic of, of being a safe person, you know, being that person that can hear the hard thing that is managing their own anxiety. So this is a little bit different, but I think some of the same principles apply. I think you can communicate assertively. I think you can talk about where you're at. I think you can talk about your desire. But ultimately, it's important that we respect the boundaries that people set. You know, even when a young adult tells a parent, I, I don't feel safe, I don't trust you, um, uh, any any other thing that might be hard to hear, the most important thing is that you you take those words at face value with with some gratitude. Or some openness, or some some uh, the in the energy of, of welcoming it. So, I don't know if I have enough detail to know exactly how to advise you. But what I would say is, continue to be safe. I, I think you could write an email, or, or probably an email is best because text tends to suggest a, a more immediate response. An email is more like a letter that can be read and digested over time. And tell him your thoughts. Say, I, I don't know that we've been safe. Um, I, I think you might have felt uh, judged by us. You know, when somebody says, I feel too anxious to talk to my parents, if they were to ask me, why do you think that is? My first assumption would, would be, well, it hasn't gone well for you in the past. So, of course, it makes sense why it's difficult to tell the truth, not just to your parents, but really to anybody. So being a safe person, overtly naming that you've been unsafe and that you think you know how to be safe, um, honoring his boundaries and even stating that ultimately if he doesn't want to engage you in, in a more connected, open way, that you can respect that and give him the space and really follow through, really following through on that is important. I'll, I'll just say it this simply for those that are listening that don't have this exact situation. When an adult tells you that they don't trust you, a really powerful thing to say to them is, thank you for telling me. I'm glad that you could tell me because in essence, that statement, I don't trust you, is itself 
a piece of vulnerable communication. And so with that vulnerable communication, you can honor it. You, you, you don't want to overstep. You don't want him. If he senses, this is the tricky part. If he senses that it's his job to take care of your grief or your loss at the, dis at the disconnection, again, you're kind of adding fuel to that fire that he needs to take care of you, which is going to lead to his anxiety. So I would, I would hang my hat on the anxiety and the lack of safety in the relationship historically. I, I would name it as overtly as I could, as clearly as I could, as specifically as I could as a parent, meaning I know I have been reactive. I know I have been anxious and, and asked you to take care of me. I know I haven't been a safe person to talk to. I know I at times haven't been respectful of your boundaries or whatever fits for you. Name it, hang your hang your hat on it, and then ultimately end up with, and I don't want to overstep, but I, I'd love an invitation to talk. Maybe that's with a family therapist. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just us, or maybe it's in emails. But but some combination of identifying your part in the historical patterns, talking about that you know what it looks like, and even demonstrating that you know that it looks like. Um, what it looks like to be a safe person for him to talk to. And then ultimately kind of stating what the boundaries that he's asking for and setting are and, and, and getting clarity on if that's what he really wants, then you can respect it. I, I think that's kind of the marching orders as I see them. It's a tricky one because when we have histories, and most of us do, of not asserting our needs, of, of being passive, passive-aggressive, of hoping that somebody's going to chase after us even after we've said we want you away or, or, or pushing them away. See, the, the hard part of, of turning this barge or this large ship around in our families and our relationships is that there isn't a lot of precedent for telling the truth, speaking your mind assertively and clearly, and having it listened to and respected. And so when you're making a, a shift in dynamics in the family, you're, it's kind of tricky because he may be playing by the old rules and that's what you could be worried about. So that's why I would get as overt and clear as I could. What I do in this situation, when, when in the past it's been a client or a family that I've worked with, is I suggest that you write a letter and that I give you feedback about it so that there aren't, any of these subtle errors that I've made reference to or any passive communication or any dismissive communication, any violation of boundaries or, or healthy communication, I, I will try to edit it so that you're saying the same thing. I'm not changing the essence of what you're saying, but I'm saying it in, in a more clear way. So helping you to write an email that, that accomplishes what I've just described is something that that I think could be helpful. So if you have a family therapist that's doing that, that is a, a, a really, for me, a really good tool and a really good process to work through. In terms of him not wanting therapy, I would name that overtly. I think in the past it's been like this. You know, I've had a family therapist in the past to 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 kind of help me dig into you, to kind of referee the family. Now I want a family therapist to keep me in check and to keep you safe. Again. He might not believe you. I suspect that he'll be skeptical at least of you. But but hang your hat on it. I, I learned that from from that um, from somebody in, in writing for for television and 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 plays that if there's an issue that it's best to to hang your hat on it to make it overt instead of making you know setting it in the background if you're trying to make uh, if you're trying to make a certain kind of point. So overt is good as aware as possible as good get some letter crafting an email and be ready to be patient you know forgiveness comes uh, on the terms and the timeline of the one who's been hurt and offended not on the timeline of the one who's done the hurting even if, if you even if you don't agree with the objective idea that you've hurt him that's still his experience and since he's living independently he doesn't have to. Another odd thought I have is you might even try or suggest 
maybe we just start from scratch and invite you over and not make it a big deal. Maybe that's what he's, he's afraid of. He's afraid that historically it's gone bad when it's been under the spotlight. So maybe it's just like, hey, do you want to come over for dinner and just catch up? Or do you want to try something lightly? That, that can be a way, that can be a part of the letter too, is that maybe we don't talk. Sometimes, just like I talked about in the sibling webinar, it's really important to, to point out, sometimes children need the, the, the right to not have to talk about their pain, right? They need to be able to say, no, I don't want to talk about it because sometimes we parents can be intrusive. Intrusions into children is a very, very common error. They're kind of powerless to resist. We have a lot of power and leverage over them. And so um, if we, and many of us do, we establish a pattern of intrusive, psychological, psychologically being intrusive with our boundaries, then the child doesn't have the, is not empowered to set boundaries for themselves. And so, again, talking about it overtly would be the way that I would attack it. And, and I would get some help, get some help from a, from a therapist, from a coach, somebody like that. Thank you for the question. Somebody writes, in trying to convey to our 15-year-old that, quote, he is good just the way he is, how do we separate that out from behaviors? We want to convey that we are genuine when we say it, suggested wording. Great question. You know, words matter. That's why, again, just like with the last question, I really like the idea of an email that you could get feedback on from somebody. Because really, the, 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 the issue is in the, the wording, right? So let me think about that. How would you communicate? I would use words like, we're worried that you're not okay. We feel like you're in pain and suffering and that you're you're apt to kind of medicate yourself in some way or another. We all have self-medicators. I think for me, when I talk to my children and I'm trying to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, I make sure to include myself on the same level with them in terms of we're all human. We all make mistakes. We all self-medicate. We all want to run away from discomfort and pain. We all use anger to kind of protect us from, from more vulnerable emotions. And so the more you can kind of join with them, the better. Um, and I think you just, two things, be very specific, specific about your wording. Talk about it in, in therapy or, or, or trauma or healing terms, not in moral terms, good, bad, right, wrong, have to, need to should ought to going back to the eight tools which is you know the podcast it's on our website there's a webinar about it it's a chapter in my book there's a blog about the eight tools one of them is not using words like good bad right wrong evil should ought to those kinds of words so be very careful about your words but also manage take responsibility for your reactions the most simple illustration that i think probably everybody can relate to on one end or or the other is if if I tell you something and your reaction is, oh my goodness, that reaction tells me that you're not a safe person to talk to, that you need to be taken care of. And if I come to you with some vulnerability, I don't want to take care of you. So, so, be clear about your words. Follow the eight tools. But take responsibility for your feelings so you're not leaking them out so the person knows that you or, or, or hears that you need to be taken care of. And I think what I've learned as a, as a father, as a therapist, really first, is to be pretty intentional about my nonverbals. My very first professor in my very first class and graduate school to become a therapist said, you're responsible when you smile. You're responsible when you laugh or when you frown. And, and, and that those reactions have an impact. When I'm sitting in therapy as a therapist, whether it's in our intensive program or if I happen to be sitting across from somebody in therapy in some other setting, the, the, the tendency to interpret even the slightest facial gesture is, is profound. They talk about how when, when therapists historically 
you know, in the beginning used to sit beside or even behind the client and the client would sit on the couch. You know, that, that image of the classic Freudian therapist that the, the client would often interpret, interpret the squeaks that the therapist chair made when, when they adjusted because we're so hyper vigilant, right? We, we have trauma. We felt responsible for our parents. And so if we're laying on the couch and the therapist be, be, sits behind us, yes, we're definitely going to interpret those things. So be responsible for your nonverbals also. Look at the eight tools, get some feedback, start off with, with an email. Could, all of those things can be helpful. All right. Thank you. And Malia has just posted for you if you want to, 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 to download the eight tools link for the podcast, the webinar, and for the blog. Thank you, Malia. Somebody writes, how do I connect with groups for my 11 year old to connect with other kids and siblings in treatment? There are there anyone who is available? I've looked everywhere. I don't imagine there's there's many places. There is something called Alateens. Alateen. You might check that. I, I don't know much about it. I've never been. I've never had somebody report back to me after going, but look at alateen.org and see if that can be a place for 11 year olds. But again, I think that might be intimidating for most 11 year olds. You know, most young children aren't inclined toward therapy or support groups. The, the real answer, what I would tell you, which is not going to make a lot of sense and and I'll say more about that in a moment, but I would find a good play therapist, a good child therapist and a good child therapist uses play. Play is the language of children. And while it might be invisible to, to, to you, what's going on, the therapist is creating a place that's safe for the child to explore their feelings. And they do it in the context of game playing and just playing together. 11 years old, I think still fits in, in that, that category of being a child where play is, is, is their language. Um, to tell you how difficult at times it is to understand the value of play therapy. One of my first internships as a student was at a play therapy clinic and I was the worst play therapist. Part of it is because I didn't, you know, I was an adult from a very young age. I didn't really have a kind of a, a traditional childhood the way most people would. I had to grow up rather fast because of my family circumstances. Um, and so I didn't know how to play with, I really wasn't good with my children when they were really young. I said to my wife, you're a much better parent to them when they're young, preteen. And when they become teenagers, I kind of rise to the occasion. I deal with teenagers a, a lot better and I'm good in a crisis. And that's not to say that one is better than the other, but we can recognize our, our strengths and weaknesses and I'm going back to the 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 idea where I came from, where, where this came from, getting somebody that can play with them, that can sit with them, sitting across from teens or, or preteens, young teens. Sometimes talk therapy isn't the best. That's why evoke therapy programs is so so effective, is because we, in addition to the talk therapy that we do, we have this small group, communal, primitive living nomadic experience, right? It's camping. It's fancy words for camping and roaming around in, in mountains in the mountains and in the desert. And that's where we get the, the rich intervention, the rich experience, the rich assessment. Oftentimes, especially with the, the younger teens in our program, I would put such little weight on the talk therapy sessions. And, and a lot of my folks would go to their group interactions, to the staff report, to, to the time that I wasn't there. I know one of the things that people ask often about wilderness therapy is why isn't the therapist there more, not just a couple of days a week? And the answer is because the intervention is experiential. It's not a, an intensive talk therapy program, although our, our, our field guides, our field staff are remarkable individuals who are very well trained compared to psych techs typically at a, at a therapeutic program, residential treatment or hospital. Um, but, but, the, the thing that I would say is use that, that, that other, the, the interaction, the experiential part to treat, to assess, not the talk therapy part. Even when I've gone to play therapy with my two younger children, 
We took them to play therapy years ago. I learned how to play. I learned what their play was telling us. Play therapy wasn't my niche. It just wasn't what I, I was geared for. I had, I had to learn to do that. I, I'm a good therapist, like I said, to adults, to parents, to, to teens who start to think in more abstract and complex ways. But those younger teens are, are sometimes a little bit difficult for me because I don't speak in, in play language, and, and they do. So those are some thoughts. Somebody writes, our son who didn't go to wilderness hasn't done the work. How can we help to engage him so he's ready to, to, to for our, when our other son comes home? Again, taking taking him to family therapy, you know, part of it is assessing with the help of a therapist if his trauma response, kind of the collateral damage that he experienced from your from your identified patient. Um, I assume this is left over from that that last broadcast I did on sibling trauma. Um, if his reluctance to participate in therapy is a trauma response, then you don't want to treat it very behaviorally. You really want to get coaching yourself. I didn't. I don't know if I said it this clearly in the sibling trauma webinar that I did last week, but I'll say it. I'll say it now. In a clearer way than I said it last week. Really, the answer in a lot of ways is to coach you how to help him, which sometimes is to not force him to do his work, depending upon his age, if he's the non-identified patient. But by forcing him to do his work, I, I said this last week for, for sure, clearly, you kind of can re-traumatize him because you're taking away his freedom. And, and now it might be for the support of the child coming home, but it's still attending to the needs of the other child. So, in other words, to, to make it very short and succinct, sometimes the question that parents have, not just about the identified patient, but also, or maybe most specifically, about the non-identified patient, really it's about parent coaching, parent training, parent education, your own work. And not to tie it back to the most common theme that I talk about in every broadcast, no matter what the subject, the silver bullet, the closest thing that we have to a silver bullet is you doing your own personal work. I, I as we're, you know, we, we've hired somebody to do admissions for us uh, in the intensive program. And one of the first things I said to her was encourage consideration. Doesn't have to be the case. It's not a, a rule of, but a consi consider, ask families, parents, adults to consider strongly the idea that they go do their own finding you first before they do a finding family or finding connection, which is our couples therapy program. I'm not going to make it a rule because I think there's many times when those are an appropriate place to start, at least with us and doing your work based on the work that you've done, but parent coaching, parent training, parent education is strange and, and at the same time simple as that sounds. That's the answer and how to, how to help your 11-year-old. Probably the younger they are, the more so. And again, just to throw myself in with you as a therapist with a PhD and a lot of experience, I went and sat with a play therapist with my younger children for several sessions to learn about them and to learn how to play, to learn what they were saying and expressing. Somebody writes, can you address college and siblings who experienced the trauma of having a sibling sent to wilderness many years ago, but still get triggered either by events around her or when her sibling is having a bad day and shared it with her? He is doing really well and is not in a place that he was, but he just hasn't processed completely all of her feelings. She just hasn't processed all of her feelings. Um, you know, hopefully that they could get some help. They could talk about it. I mean, I, I wrote something on my, my social media today. One of the things I like to do on social media a lot is post about concepts and therapy. Um, what it means to be an effective or an adequate therapist and what the process looks like. 
for two reasons I do it. And I'll get back to this question because it relates. Number one, I, I kind of want to give you some tools to make assessments about what a good therapist might look like and how to, how to measure them. That's part of what I'm doing. Second thing that I'm doing is I think the, the principles that apply to being a good therapist translate really, really well to being a good partner, spouse, parent, for sure, friend, a coworker, boss, employee, citizen. So, so part of, part of my answer to this question is, um, understanding kind of where you fit in this. Uh, do you need them to get better for you? Do they have to do work so that their sibling will be okay? Is it about the siblings? Thing? You know, what needs of their, theirs are being addressed or, or neglected. And again, you know, I'd say this is a general rule. Do your work first. Everybody, no matter what your question is about marriage or, or other relationships in your family of origin or the family you created with your children, the foundation is your work. That's the first ingredient. After that's started and there's some headway made there, then we start to talk about couple dynamics and family dynamics. And so, because you're just not clear what is their issue and what is yours. We're not clear as parent what is our anxiety and what is an objective problem. I mean, that's all of us, even me, who does this for a living, who trains, who teaches. I need people in my life. We have employed and will continue to employ therapists in our life, myself, my wife, my children, my, our family. You need something outside. It's not a weakness. It's just ignorance to believe that the project can be done on your own. So do your work. Talk to a therapist. Sort it out. It might take several sessions, many sessions, before you make that first move with the sibling. Make the first invitation or, or write the first letter or start the first conversation around this. That would be my, my suggestion. Somebody says, Dr. Reedy's podcast and all the other Evoke supports have been so helpful to me and so many on so many levels. I'm frustrated with my being stuck in old familiar thoughts and behaviors I know are, that I know are destructive. I'm hoping Dr. Reedy can address that self-trapping of destructive behavior thoughts and, and, be, and behaviors. You know, I read something uh, yesterday that I want to share with you that's on my social media. I, I thought it was absolutely beautiful and profound. Here's what it says. It says, um, don't fight your demons. Your demons are here to teach you lessons. Sit down with your demons and have a drink and a chat and learn their names and talk about the burns on their fingers and the scratches on their ankles. Some of them are very nice. This just came up in the intensive in several different situations. Before you want to get rid of your, your patterns, your, your, your symptoms, your, your defenses, listen to them, make friends with them. They're, they're not the enemy. They're not the problem. They are messengers from the unconscious trying to express to you unmet needs. So my answer to the question is, is about how to deal with self continuing self sabotaging patterns my first thought is welcome to the club you know therapy begins at a new level when you get sick of sick of yourself saying the same things when you're just about ready to give up if you have an adequate therapist if that's been determined therapy begins when you're sick of yourself when the judgment the the discouragement the hopelessness is so heavy that you want to give up on yourself. And the, the, the next session is the breakthrough. And I don't mean breakthrough because it's a big epiphany. I mean, it's like it's stepping past that. We have so many judgments. I talked about this in the journey of the heroic parent. To use the story from the, from the Bible, the book of Genesis, the story about Adam and Eve and the serpent, they took the fruit of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, and then the serpent whispered in their ear to hide. The serpent said, see, you are naked. Go cover yourself up with fig leaves and hide from God because he's coming. So what does that mean? If we don't think of it as a history lesson and we think of it as, as a lesson that's teaching us, 
It is that the lie that we believe is that when we are naked, when we are ourselves, nakedness is a symbol in this story for being who you are, that we're unacceptable. And we hide from the light, from, from God, from the source, from, from each other. Uh, on the contrast, when people get wounded enough and desperate enough, alcoholics, drug addicts, sex addicts, codependents, that they somehow make it into a 12-step support group or into a therapist's office, and they finally can tell the truth about who they are and what they've done. And then they have a different response than the response they had from their childhood or from their family of origin or from their teachers or from even previous therapists or partners. That's the healing moment. That's what therapy is, folks. I, I know I'm not doing therapy with all of you right now. I know I'm teaching, but what I'm really trying to invite gently is a more compassionate dis discussion with yourself. So when I hear this question and the judgments that, that you're judging against yourself, that's the problem, not the behaviors themselves. That's the irony. The symptom is the messenger, like I said. Like the quote I just read you, make friends with your demons. Ask about the scratches and the burn marks. They have something to tell you. I love in the, in the movie Finding Joe, one of my most uh, recommended movies for parents and families and couples. Finding Joe, you can find it on, on YouTube. You can buy it on, on, on Apple TV or some other services, probably on Amazon Prime, other streaming services. Finding Joe by Patrick Solomon. Um, when you watch that movie, one of the things that they explain, or, or Gay Hendricks, the, the gentleman explains, his name is Gay, he says, um, you know, Joseph Campbell talks about in mythology that we have to defeat our, our, our dragons. And he said, I like to think of it as making friends with your dragon. And then when you make friends with your dragon, the dragon gives up the thing that it was hoarding, the, the treasure. So when you start to, to, to make peace with the things that you think are your enemies, you get the gift that they're hiding. Your behaviors, your self-destructive thoughts and behaviors that you want to get rid of are here to tell you something. So don't try to get rid of your anger. Try to listen to it. It has something to tell you. And find a guide that can help you listen to it more effectively, more clearly. Somebody writes, I aspire to be a loving, understanding, and supportive person to my kids. However, I find myself struggling with feelings of disappointment for my 16-year-old daughter. She is not the sister I would like her to be for her struggling 14-year-old sister. I recognize this comes from my own place of anxiety. And it is largely my issue to address. I'm not sure if there's a boundary to uphold regarding lack of kindness and simple compassion for a struggling si sibling. As an example, my 16-year-old will not allow my 14-year-old to sit next to her at school lunch or at a sporting event, even though my 14-year-old is alone with no one to sit with. I find this heartbreaking. Brad, can you please talk me through this quandary? Thank you. You know, sometimes sometimes somebody told me this week, and more than one person told me this week at the intensive that I have a lot of repetitive themes, and part of me wants to apologize for that, and part of me also knows that that's because there are some central truths woven throughout this work. And so just like with the previous parents, what I would say to you is, instead of trying to change your 16-year-old behaviors, learn about it. And how do you learn about it? Doing your own work. When you can start to make friends with your dragons and demons, you'll recognize them in your children too. Years ago, after describing to my therapist um, some behavior from somebody that I worked with, from a colleague, very specifically, describing some behavior in a, in a certain interaction we, we had, my therapist is incredibly intelligent, and she succinctly and, and accurately and insightfully diagnosed my colleague. This is where it comes from. This is what it is. 
and this is how it shows up and what you're describing fits it. So she, she diagnosed my colleague for me. And I've, I've told the story recently. I said, but I don't go back and just tell her that. And my therapist shook her head and said, no, you don't. And I said, so, but, but knowing that having that inform me can change the way that I respond to her you know, respond accordingly. We were talking about it at the intensive this week. And I said to the group, I was in a relationship with a narcissist in business for a long time. And the word I used was asshole. And my therapist for 10 years confirmed, yeah, this person's an asshole. The implied message was, what are you going to do? You keep trying to get this person to change. That's your problem. You're becoming part of the problem. And now you're contributing to the problem. I say the same thing to your children. I joke about this, but it's true. The way I get their attention when I visit the groups is I start talking about how crazy you all are. And they usually look at me with some energy, right? Their eyes light up. And I don't try to defend you or try to normalize what you're doing. I just say, yeah, your parents are flawed. I don't know if they're all ever changed. They're screwed up. They have anxiety. They put it on you. I make these broad sweeping statements and the implied message is, what are you going to do? Because if you spend your time trying to punish them, trying to change them, trying to please them, trying to argue with them, you're wasting your time. So back to your question, um, I can't answer it specifically, but what I can tell you is it's founded again. It's grounded in your work, working with your demons, finding them, and then recognizing them in your child. All I do with you all is share with you what I've experienced and learned from doing my own work. I can sit in a room with a, with somebody and listen to them talk for half an hour or so. And I can see them with, with some clarity diagnostically because I've explored the landscape because the landscape is me. I'm them. I'm everybody. I might not have the same behaviors to the same extent. I might not have hurt people or, or myself in the exact same ways that they've hurt people or hurt themselves. That's true. That's always true. Those, those details are, are different, are unique but I'm essentially the same. While I might not be violent, I've cut somebody off on the road out, for, out of frustration. I've yelled at somebody aggressively before. And, and the difference in severity is inconsequential, unimportant. It's learning, learning what it means to be human, and then I can see other humans. So do your own work, discover your own self. It'll help you see your children clearly. The research is complete. It's cross-cultural. It's true decade after decade when we study it in attachment theory, attachment-based therapy. Your childhood, your childhood, and your awareness of it up to this point in your life is the key to unlocking the door to everybody else. Your, ch your, children, your children, excuse me, first and foremost. So... I wouldn't try to change their behavior first and foremost. You can set boundaries eventually, but I'd try to understand it first. And once you understand it, respond accordingly. Respond from that informed place. You know, you hear the phrase trauma-informed therapy. This is trauma-informed parenting. Trauma-informed friends. Trauma-informed being a boss. Being a coworker, being a colleague. Somebody writes, can you talk about what a second stay in the wilderness looks like? Do you see many second timers? Time frame of the stay. Have you found some of it helpful as a reset? I've always said historically that I, I personally, personally had fewer. I, I think it's because I didn't grow up with, with any money. I grew up in, in a household where we were didn't have much money, and I, I have some issues around money and some guilt around money. And so I know we're an expensive program. And so I always feel that responsibility and obligation, especially with second timers. So it might be that issue. 
I might be kind of overprotecting people with that issue. So I'll just own that. I don't think I've ever said that out loud anywhere before, but but that's true. Um, but yeah, it can be super effective. And the length of stake oftentimes is shorter. Sometimes it reaches the average, but usually it's shorter. When I, see, when I did see my returning students myself, I was so happy to see them. And most every time they were happy to see me. And I really tried to reset without judgment, without shame. I would always say to them, it's so good to see you. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances, but man, it's really good to see you. I would ask them how they felt, if they felt ashamed coming back to see me, that they had failed or not lived up to what they thought were, were my expectations, so we could start there. And so, I mean, if we weren't worried about money, if we didn't have hangups about living in mainstream society is the only way that you can progress and live life, second timers would be, I would, I would love it all the time. Like I've said, hundred times to you. I've been in therapy with my therapist for 22 years. That's a second, third, fourth, and fifth timer, right? I just haven't left. I just keep going. The work is forever. The work is until you die. That applies to you. That applies to me. And that applies to your children. The hope that I have with, with any kind of therapy, my, my most basic hope is that it's a positive enough experience that if you need help, that it's a safe and sweet place to go back to. Just before this, I talked to somebody that, that had, I'd seen in the wilderness, I think six years ago. Hadn't seen them since. Just today, they reached out to me to check in because they were going through a difficult day, a difficult moment in their relationship. When I come out to New York in a couple of weeks, I'm going to see one of my students that I had 10 years ago. When I have somebody reach, I had a student reach out to me asking um, about his son, which is interesting. But what that tells me is that I provided a safe place for them. That they can come back to me without shame. I'm thinking of other students that I've reconnected with. So second timers can be fantastic. If... The money weren't an issue or timelines weren't, we weren't so hung up on them. I would have had lots of students back again. So if it's needed and the team thinks it, I say go for it. And then it's, it's a new level, right? You're starting, you're not starting from scratch. And you really can, you know, after I said, it's good to see you. And we expressed our, our, our warmth and affection for each other. I would say, let's figure this out. Like what happened? Why did it happen? Without shame, just we've all regressed. We all at times in life take two steps forward and three steps back. So let's just explore together. Somebody says, what is a typical transition for young adults after their time in the wilderness home transitional programs? It's about the same number as our, our, our adolescents, about two thirds go on to some kind of therapeutic living situation, sober living, transitional programs, sometimes a residential treatment, sometimes a, a, a treatment program for substance abuse because they, they need longer. Um, some go home or back to school or back to college. So, th so those can occur. But um, the difference between adolescents and young adults, of course, is that young adults get to choose. Sometimes the, the parental leverage of support can be a strong impetus and an encourager, motivator for them to continue on in treatment. But ultimately, they, they have to choose. And so you try to bring them on board to some extent as a wilderness therapist to kind of own the decision. You don't, you don't play it heavy-handed by any means. You try to give them some choice, some preference within the range of things that the parents and the professionals that are working with them at home would support. You try not to play the big leverage or the cutoff card for sure. Um, but yeah, it's about the same, about two thirds. Transitional living, sober living, treatment programs, residential treatment, all of those things are on the table. And then, and then of course, the other third 
it would be home or going back to college or, or some other non-therapeutic setting. All right. It looks like we don't have any more questions right now. So I'm going to go over upcoming events and announcements, and then you can, um, if you submit any questions while I'm doing this, I'll, I'll check in again at the, after I go over all of this. My two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity View, I wrote about this on my social media today. It's my attempt to invite you, the reader, into having a more compassionate conversation with yourself. And even though we, we were taught to hate or dislike or be disgusted by our symptoms, I don't think that works in the long run. I think the answer is compassion, which leads to understanding and insight, which leads to healing. That's the therapeutic process. That's the path. So the journey of the heroic parent, of course, mostly focuses about focuses on parenting, but I've had non-parents read it, talk about it from their own childhood perspective and their other relationships. And then the audacity to be you both are available on Amazon. And I did read the audio book to the audacity to be you. If that's something that you prefer, we have support groups for, for wilderness, current wilderness families and alumni families. So if you are current or alumni family, October 14th, that's in two days at 630 Mountain Time is our next support group. We also have an alumni only meeting once a month, and that'll be on October 26th, 630 p.m. Mountain Time. And then for our intensives alumni, November 9th, once a month, November 9th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Just email Malia at evoketherapy.com for more information. If you want a deep dive in your own work and having just finished a returning to you this week and loving the experience. Uh, I continue to encourage you that I think this is the best way to spend your time and resources. If you want to help your child, in my opinion, this is a, a fundamentally important thing for you to do. I cannot oversell it. Remember before when I said I felt guilty about money and how expensive everything thing is, I don't feel that way with this because it's worth every single penny in every case. And it's a lot less expensive than wilderness therapy. So November 10th through 14th, December 8th through 12th are our next two finding yous. And then we also have an online version, November 5th through 7th. So if time or financial resources are an issue, the online one is a really great option. Half the time, no travel, less than half the cost. We will be settling, setting another date for our next returning to you, which is kind of the program after finding you. Just contact intensives at evoketherapy.com for more information. We have therapy coaches at Evoke. If you want a, 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 an attachment-based coach trained by me in the Evoke Therapy way, contact coaching at evoketherapy.com. We have a pursuits program for young adults or for families. Think therapy light. Sometimes it's great for younger children too because, again, you're, you're going to have a, a better conversation fly fishing or, or whitewater rafting the Snake River than you would sitting across from them in a therapy room in a therapy session. So talk to uh, Sarah at evoketherapy.com if you're interested in our adventure pursuits trips. We ask all current parents to go to six 12-step support groups, any combination of alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org. I'm a big fan of adultchildren.org. I would ask you all from my perspective to try that one time if if you haven't. RefugeRecovery.org is a Buddhist-inspired program, less of an emphasis on a higher power. NAMI.org is a great national organization with local chapters to find free classes and resources for, for families, parents, individuals. All of these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app. Just search Finding You an Evoke Therapy podcast on your favorite podcast app, including Spotify, or go to soundcloud.com on your computer and search Finding You there. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find us using the handles at Evoke Therapy or at Dr. Brad Reedy. That's at D-R-B-R-A-D-R-E-E-D-Y. You can also find us on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives or on Facebook. You can find Evoke Therapy programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives by searching those keywords there. My next broadcast, I'm done for the week. I have another intensive this week Then I'm on vacation next week. My next, my next broadcast will be Tuesday, October 26th. 
and I'll be talking about school refusal, how to handle school refusal. Um, so I look forward to that. Um, in the meantime, you can check out our, our, our library of podcasts and webinars if you have questions. All right. Are, are there any questions that came in while I was doing that? Somebody writes, how does Evoke handle emotional dysregulation in the moment? I don't hear you say much about validation as a technique. Validation, mindfulness. We, we teach mindfulness, meditation as a way to, to handle emotional dysregulation. You know, taking some space, not as a punishment, not as a as a forced timeout, but taking some space. And validation is always a key source. Some therapists are trained in dialectical behavioral therapy. So they're going to use those tools and techniques there. Some students can can, can go through can go through DBT workbooks while they're with us. If emotional dysregulation is a pretty powerful and overwhelming feeling or, or theme in their lives and their behavior, mindfulness listening, validation, absolutely. Somebody writes, my eight-year-old son is bright, socially precocious, and emotionally healthy as compared to our other children. I love the idea of listening to hear the message that's not always portrayed in spoken words. My son often uses sarcasm instead of speaking vulnerably and authentically. Can you speak about what it means when children use sarcasm and what that conveys? Also, how can I help him shift away from hiding his emotions behind sarcasm? I'll answer that last question second. But again, just like with any other symptom or behavior, the question is, it's a defense against the threat. I mean, it's this, it's this simple. Defenses, defenses are protections that we put in place against a perceived or an experience of threat. So to tear down a defense to remove somebody's crutch before counting the cost, before knowing what's at stake, is unkind. You can have a boundary about the way that you get treated. That's, that's, you're allowed to do that because that's about you. But to rip somebody's crutch away because it's for their own good, not exactly what I would call adequate therapy or, or kindness or compassion. So I would get curious about the sarcasm. Why do you use sarcasm? We use sarcasm because assertive communication, talking about how we really feel, hasn't gone so well in the past. You know, you can start with some of those basic assumptions and, and test them. You can test them by asking if they're verbal enough to talk about it. You can ask curious questions about sarcasm. Why did you say it that way? Did you really mean this? And again, not from a judgmental place. So, so even my tone of voice is going to communicate uh, the, the, it's going to distinguish between compassion, curiosity, and judgment. Don't think of the sarcasm as wrong or bad. That's key. Think of the sarcasm as a message for something that you don't yet understand. I've shared this with you before, but my mother-in-law who, who taught school for her entire career after reading The Journey of the Heroic Parent she said to me, you should teach teachers about children. And I said, if I was, was going to teach teachers, which I have, I would teach them how to listen. I cannot overstate what I'm about to, to say to you. And I know I've already said it a couple of times, but I'm going to say it for emphasis here. The path to mental health is listening to symptoms and the message they have to share with us, not getting rid of symptoms. You can have any boundary you want and any boundary you need to keep yourself safe. You're allowed to do that. But if we're talking about treating somebody else or parenting somebody else and what, what can we do to be helpful and facilitate healing and mental health, it's shifting from thinking of, I say this to the therapist all the time, Stop thinking of good and bad behaviors, right and wrong behaviors. And start thinking about what they're trying to tell us, what's beneath them. Follow them, like I say in the journey of the heroic parent, follow them like a, cra like, a, like a trail of crumbs back home to the source, to where, to where the real issue or, or the wound lies. When I listen to somebody be sarcastic, 
I just get curious. I gently, I try to be gentle. Sometimes I say nothing. But if I'm going to be active, if I'm going to do something, I try to gently inquire what's going on for them. And I try to do it with, without the, the tone that comes with judgment. Somebody writes, I, I attended my adult son's appointment with his psychiatrist today. The doctor asked, what do you see yourself doing in a year? My son replied, nothing. I sat in silence as if I did not know what to say. What, if anything, could I or should I have said? I don't know if that I don't know that saying anything would have helped. I, I I question the idea of you being in the therapy in the in the session with the psychiatrist. Uh, I don't know how valuable that would be if your son would be safe. You know, the observation, your presence changes things. It might be that might be about his relationship with you. I don't know. It's possible. I would probably try to join with him. I would probably try to imagine why I might answer that question and try to connect or empathize with them. So I might, I think in essence, I wouldn't say anything in that, in that example that you gave. I, I probably wouldn't. I remember one of the times, one of the last times I was in family therapy with my adult son, one of my children, and it seemed that we were going through a, the, the therapist started off with kind of a, a report from my son about how he was doing. And after a moment or two, I just stopped them both. And I said, I don't need this. This isn't a session for you to be accountable. I said, unless, unless I'm going to be accountable next. You know, unless my wife is going to be next and we're all going to do this, then I guess I could probably buy into it. But I don't want this to be you sitting in the interview chair and on the hot seat and ask, asking you how you're doing. I suspect that it doesn't feel very safe for him. I suspect that to take a risk and to tell the truth wouldn't go well for him. I suspect that it's, you know, when he says what he fantasizes about, that he'd been critic that he's been told, well, you're not, you're not taking the steps. I've done that to kids before. I've had kids say, I want to go be a professional soccer player. And, and, and I've said things like, well, why'd you get kicked off the team in high school for smoking pot? Then doesn't sound like you want to be a professional soccer player. I've done stuff like that before. Everybody has shame somebody for their lofty goals, pointed out the inconsistency between their behavior and what their stated goal is. So I got to assume that he doesn't feel safe. He might, if he doesn't know, that's a wonderful thing to discover too. Maybe he's trying to live one day at a time. Maybe his not knowing is honest. I don't know why he said, I don't know. I don't really like the idea of you being in there. It's not your fault. I'd rather have you meet with the psychiatrist separate if you have concerns and you are going to be in with the psychiatrist. Maybe you're concerned that he or she doesn't know what's going on or everything's not being reported. I like that. I don't really like the idea of you being in somebody else's therapy session and having them being asked a question by their mental health provider in front of you. I don't imagine many kids would do well with that, actually. So those are some thoughts. I hope that wasn't too blunt or abrasive because I don't blame you. You don't, nothing would tell you that that was a, not, not a great idea, but just for me, it, it, it's not a great idea. Not a great idea. I'm a little bit skeptical about it. All right. So, um, I think we're at the end. Thanks for joining me. For and on behalf of the people that love you, thank you for doing your work. Keep doing your work. Keep listening to the recordings. Keep reading the books. Um, the, the solution and key to the entire universe is in here. Like the, the quote Adelphi says, know thyself first. That, that will hold all the answers to the universe. The Buddha sat under the tree long enough that he saw the whole universe because it was in him. So thank you for joining me this evening. It's my I hope these are helpful points of contact for you. 
I hope I can be helpful to you. Take care. I'll see you after my vacation. Bye-bye.